Good morning. I'm Brooke Thompson, Executive Vice President of Government Affairs at AIM. We're speaking with Pam Everhart, Senior Vice President, Regional Public Affairs and Community Relations at Fidelity Investments. Pam is also one of the 19 founders of the new Commonwealth Racial Equity and Social Justice Fund. The group has set an ambitious goal of raising at least $100 million and has already begun issuing grants to organizations working on racial equity and social justice matters. Pam, welcome. 2020 has shined a spotlight on racial inequity and racial injustice. And John Regan's speech asked the question, are we forever changed as a result of what transpired in 2020? Pam, in your assessment with regard to racial equity and justice, are we forever changed by the awakening that took place in 2020? Thank you, Brooke, and good morning. I really appreciate the opportunity to speak with you on this very important topic. At the outset, my short answer to your question is, I hope so. The COVID-19 global pandemic disrupted our lives and the economy. It created financial hardship for many and disproportionately resulted in loss of lives among the elderly and black and brown people. At the same time, in the wake of the brutal murder of George Floyd and other horrific racially charged incidents, issues of racial inequality and social injustice in this country were amplified. Now, while 2020 was a challenge in many ways, it has provided an opportunity for business leaders to be more intentional around and accountable for driving change to more effectively advance racial equity. I think to attract the best talent to remain relevant and be competitive in the future, employers will have to be committed to fair and equitable treatment for every employee, for every customer, and every potential customer, and to create a respectful environment in which all employees are offered an opportunity to add value and be successful. Now more than ever, we need to be well connected to our underserved communities and respond to challenges that stem from racial inequity and social injustice. However, we need to show up in the right way. We need to be holistic in our approach. And most importantly, we need to be authentic. I was wondering, can you talk a little bit about what you wanna see coming out of the new Commonwealth Fund? Although racial inequities exist at almost every level and area of American society, our fund is initially focused in four areas, health equity, policing and criminal justice, youth education, empowerment, and civic engagement. My hope is that our grants will drive sustainable change in these four areas and help create solutions to reduce the economic vulnerability of black and brown families, to break the cycle of poverty and improve the economic inequality of black and brown communities across the Commonwealth. I wonder how do, in your assessment, how do we measure permanent and sustainable change with respect to race relations? Measuring inclusive practices, accountability, and top talent. So you have to measure the extent to which inclusive practices are embedded in all levels of decision-making. Your practices cannot merely be layered on top. Second, there must be accountability for all, and that must be measured. Leaders must commit to new behaviors that will help the entire organization increase diversity and inclusion. And third, top talent. You gotta measure the diversity of that top talent. Your top talent and leadership development programs, as well as opportunities for sponsorship, must be inclusive with an intentional focus on members of underrepresented communities, including people of color. These measurements must also go beyond employees. A company's products and services should resonate with all of its customers, not just the majority. Thank you, Pam. Uh, not only for your amazing insight and thoughts that you've shared with us today, but for your incredible leadership um, on this issue. Uh, we are so thrilled and I wanna thank you again for being here with us today. Thank you, Brooke.
Good morning. I'm Donna Latson Gittins, founder of More Advertising in Watertown and a member of the Associated Industries of Massachusetts Board of Directors. Our guest is Edward Glazer, the Fred and Eleanor Glimp Professor of Economics at Harvard University and author of the book Triumph of the City, How Our Greatest Invention Makes Us Richer, Smarter, Greener, Healthier and Happier. Welcome, Professor Glazer. Thank you so much for talking to me. To begin, what is the future of cities like Boston in a world where the acceptance of remote work may allow some of the best and brightest do their jobs remotely from lower cost locations? This is the question that everyone is asking. I do think it depends a lot on whether or not the pandemic risk remains permanent or whether or not we move towards a, a post-pandemic uh, world. In the latter case, where vaccines are distributed, where we don't have a, a second wave of pandemic in the next five to 10 years, I believe that by and large, things will get back to normal. There is no question that significant numbers of people who have switched to Zooming to work will stay Zooming to work. But I think it runs against the enduring power of the cities, both as places of productivity and as places of pleasure. It's not just that we get great ideas by working around with each other, it's also fun. That's an incredible int introduction to the next question. Will high cost superstar cities in general continue to be the drivers of economic growth? Well, I think there'll be a little bit less high cost, quite honestly. I think it would be very, very shocking if the decline in demand for working face-to-face -face doesn't lead to some kind of drop in commercial real estate prices. I think by and large, cities that are strong in their human capital, cities that are strong in connecting will continue to thrive, even though they will be a little bit cheaper. But not every city is ordained to succeed. And I think when we think about policy going forward, Local governments, state governments need to understand that this is a moment of vulnerability and that they really need to pay attention to providing the kinds of, of business environment that businesses need. Mm -hmm. So how will now embedded concerns about gatherings affect the service economy, restaurants, real, retail stores, hotels, the symphony that helps to define the quality of life in cities? You're absolutely right. And again, I think this depends crucially on whether or not vaccines work and the pandemic risk abates. You know, in 2019, one fifth of American workers, 32 million of them, labored in retail trade, leisure and hospitality. Those jobs are incredibly vulnerable uh, to pandemic. So it's incredibly important that we make the kind of health investments we need to make sure that this doesn't happen again. And if we do those things. If the, the pandemic risk abates, I think we will be back in the symphony as soon as we possibly can. What will the workplace changes that John Regan outlined, how would that affect the cost and the availability of housing in major metropolitan centers? So uh, I think it's quite likely that uh, you will see some conversion of commercial space to residential space. Mm -hmm. If you think about where the enduring appeal of, of urban life comes from, ultimately it is more guaranteed by our desire to be near other human beings, to enjoy life together with other human beings than it is necessarily by our need to work next to other human beings. And so I think there will be a bit of a conversion of commercial to uh, residential space. That will tend to make things a bit cheaper. Uh, so that there should be some uh, modest drop in, in the cost of living. But it also sounds like transportation getting around is a, a question. So what role will public transportation play in the ability of cities to emerge from the current crisis? Will workers ever return to crowded MBTA trains and buses? <laughs> or has the pottery of the urban economy been permanently severed? Well, it's uh, it's certainly going to be a rough time, and it has been a rough time for the MBTA. But again, I think it's a question of, of how quickly the pandemic risk ends. In the medium run, if it's safe, people will go back. I mean, the T is just too convenient. It's too hard to, to get around without it. And cars on the road, will we see a lot more of those? We certainly need to be careful about this. Boston was not easy to drive around pre-pandemic, and you know it would be great if it could be made a little bit easier post-pandemic. Well, amid the challenges that large cities face, is it also fair to say that some of the knowledge that has brought us through the pandemic uh, from remote communication platforms to the Moderna vaccine could only have been developed in a city like Boston? 
I think there is a lot to be, I mean, there, there are lots of things to be proud of. I think the, the pharmaceutical industry has done unbelievably well in terms of vaccine development. I think that's something that's unquestionably Boston should be very proud of. The human capital in this region is exceptional and it remains the surest guarantee that Boston will continue to be a capital of the information age for decades to come. Professor Edward Glazer, thank you so much for your insights. Thank you for talking to me. Hello, I'm Kristen Rupert, Senior Vice President for External Affairs at AIM. And with me today is Nada Sanders, Distinguished Professor of Supply Chain Management at Northeastern University. Nada has provided consulting services to a wide variety of Fortune 500 companies, including Mattel, Nike, Dell, IDG, and others. She's also quoted widely in the press. Nada, we're hearing a lot about reshoring, particularly as it relates to the shortages of PPE experienced in the U.S. over the past year. Can you talk a little bit about this? First, uh, thank you for having me, Kristen. Uh, and yes, uh, what we saw with the pandemic was these massive supply chain disruptions across the board, from toilet paper to PPE and so forth. The response has been, well, how about reshoring? The reality of it is that it is simply untenable, unrealistic to do that. We could not scale production. We don't have many of the component parts and resources. It would be a massive effort, not to mention that costs of products would skyrocket. So what is the answer? Uh, the answer, um, I think, is twofold. One, I think uh, companies need to diversify their supplier portfolio in a lot of ways, and one is by location. So yes, there's going to be some reshoring, but we should continue with China, consider Southeast Asia, Mexico, and other regions in order to create a portfolio of suppliers that is balanced so we balance out our risks. And the second aspect is, I think, investing in technology to provide visibility, to be able to see up the supply chain where the problems are. Now let's talk about digitization. Certainly the past year has accelerated the movement towards digital commerce. You're a forecaster. Are we going to continue to see this? What's it going to look like over the next year? Digitization is here to stay. I think it is naive to think that we're going to go back to the same habits, that consumers are going to go back to the same habits. They're not. So that poses a whole host of challenges for businesses in a lot of different ways. They're going to have to figure out ways in order to move products when you're actually uh, handling one item at a time versus pallets. They're also going to have to consider uh, things like what's called co-optition, where you work with your competitors to pool resources and to aggregate in order to jointly be able to respond to the market. Okay, that's a good lead into my next question, which is companies talk about how the events of the past year have forced them to reimagine their businesses and build resilience. So can you talk a little bit about that? Kristen, it's a great question. Every company that I'm talking to, and I'm talking to a lot of companies uh, across industry sectors, the magic word is, or there are multiple magic words. One is resilience. We have to build resilience. Two is we have to pivot. And that's what I hear across the board. Um, but what I believe is really important for companies is to reimagine, to reinvent. And I think it's not going to be looking at historical data, we've already seen that historical data does not indicate what the future is going to look like. We are in uncharted territories. One of the suggestions I have is for companies to consider something that um, certain companies like Ford has done. They have actually a futurist. The idea is to uh, create a process where the team ideates differently, where the team ideates it's about what customers are going to be doing, what they're going to be wanting, 
how the company can reinvent itself, reimagine its product offering, its delivery, its position in the marketplace. Just surveying consumers and cu customers is not going to cut it. Okay, I've got one more question for you, a little bit different investment. So as companies look at investments over the coming months and years, and as the U.S. government looks at investments, uh, what are we likely to see? I think that healthcare, healthcare, healthcare in every aspect of it. And I mean, end to end from medicine, the medical community to PPE to pharma. Thank you. All right. Unfortunately, we're out of time. Thank you, Nada Sanders of Northeastern University for sharing your insights with us. Thank you for having me. Good morning. My name is Vasundar Sangar, and I am Associate Vice President of Government Affairs here at AIM. Our guest today is Dr. Lee Schwamm, a neurologist and director of the Center for Telehealth at Massachusetts General Hospital and the system-wide Vice President for Virtual Care at Mass General Brigham. Dr. Schwamm, thank you so much for being here with us this morning. Oh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. As a physician and as someone with telehealth expertise specifically, you've seen firsthand how technology was able to change the delivery of health care throughout the pandemic. Do you see these trends continuing post-pandemic? There's no question in my mind that virtual care is here to stay. We went from doing several thousand visits a week to doing 1.38 million visits virtually. What you can see here in this graph uh, is shown the ambulatory visits in person in the first half of the fiscal year, right up until the middle of March, where you can see an enormous drop off in the volume of care. The dark blue bars indicate when virtual visits were first implemented. And you can see that over the course of of the next several months until the end of September, virtual visits help to restore care for those who need it the most without any suggestion of overutilization or inappropriate use. Beyond the virtual delivery of healthcare, do you see some other ways where the healthcare system will look permanently different post-pandemic? Well, I think we had to make a lot of choices during the pandemic to figure out what the best way to deliver care was in the most efficient manner, how to streamline our governance so that we could be more nimble, and so I think what you're going to see is many more people will be able to work from home if their role doesn't require them to be physically present. I think we're going to have a more flexible understanding of how to assemble teams together. And I think we may see, at least in the academic medical center environment, a change in the way we govern. Healthcare has been a driver of the Massachusetts economy for decades. We've seen all the losses that it suffered throughout the pandemic, not including a significant number of job loss. Do you see the, rec the sector resuming uh, its role as an economic engine once COVID-19 has been dealt with further? I think it's a tremendous opportunity. It's sort of the equivalent of the green revolution in you know, energy delivery. I think that what we realize now is we, are, we have built up an enormous bolus of unmanaged chronic disease. People avoided seeking health care because they were afraid to come in. We're going to pay the price for that. We're going to see more disease events. And so we have to figure out how we can reach out. And rather than worried about overutilization, I'm worried about underutilization. We have to bring patients back into managed care. Our virtual care programs were enormously helpful for patients with behavioral health and substance use disorders. And we know they consume a disproportionate amount of resources. So telehealth virtual care gives us an ability to reach out and maintain connectivity with those patients, helping them avoid unnecessary visits to the office with lots of ancillary costs. So I think we have an opportunity to be a major driver of the economy uh, in the coming, you know, sort of three to six quarters by leveraging the gains that we developed with our virtual care understanding and layering them on top of a post-pandemic environment. Awesome. Um, and this one's a little bit of a more personal question, but as a physician yourself, were you surprised to, to witness the global vulnerability to the pandemic? You know, we work very hard in medicine to create what we call high reliability systems, systems with lots of fail safes so that we are prepared to switch out whatever we're doing with something else if it doesn't work. We did not have a backup medical delivery system here that was primed and ready to go. I think going forward, we will. There's no reason why we shouldn't think about virtual care as the equivalent of the National Guard or the Army Reserve. And this really builds off of that. Um, 
some of the primary lessons that you think we should take away from a crisis of this magnitude? The most important lesson to me is just how vulnerable a sector of our population was and how poorly served. Mm -hmm. And I just don't think we can ever let that happen again. We have to build more robust systems to ensure that whatever your language, whatever your ethnicity, whatever your background, whatever your financial status, we have a way to embrace you. I think the second thing is to realize that a lot of things we didn't think we could do with technology, we really can do. Those were some great topics that we touched on. And again, thank you so much. It's my pleasure. And you know, your membership is the one that's going to drive regulatory change and ensure that employers are getting the care they need for their employees. So I'm delighted to participate in this conversation. Wonderful. Thank you so much.